Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hope you're doing well. We're continuing our reading of the biography that talks about Uthman bin Affan's life, some of his governing styles and everything else. So we're going to continue upon that path. Thanks for joining in. Bismillah rahman rahim Okay. His policy in allotting land. Abu Bakr had applied the Prophet's policy of allotting land to people so that they would make it arable. Umar also had nothing against the allotment of land to make it arable. He was only against the idea of drawing people close to Islam through it. Umar himself allotted a lot of land in his implementation of the Prophet's policies. When Uthman became the caliph, he expanded the allotment of land, especially in the newly conquered areas from which many landowners had fled, leaving behind their fields. Okay, so Uthman became the caliph, and then we have all this land that has to be redistributed. So, it's up on the market. The state could utilize this land. Hence, Uthman allotted some of it rather than let it go to ruin. Smart, you know, got to maintain those resources. Imam Ahmed suggests that he allotted land from Sawad as well. Undoubtedly, most of the abandoned lands might have been within it. In any case, allotting the abandoned lands increased their yearly profit from 9 million dinars during Umar's time to 50 million dinars in the era of Uthman. We can see that his policy of managing the abandoned lands was successful. So Uthman managing the abandoned lands. History books mentioned a list specifying the names of all those to whom Uthman allotted land. Most of those individuals were not from Quraysh, even though most of the narrations regarding Uthman's allotment of land are classified as weak. They do affirm that he expanded this practice for the benefit of the readers. We present this list. Okay, let's see. Abdullah bin Masood al-Hudhali, the land between the rivers of Bil and Sawad. Amar bin Yasser, Istinia. Habab bin al-Arat al-Timimi, Sa'nabi, a village in Sawad. Adi bin Hatim Atay Araha, a village in Baghdad by the river of Abbas. Saad ibn Abi Waqas, the village of Hormuz in the land of Persia. Oh, look at that! As Zubair bin Al Awam, Usaba bin Zaid, Said bin Zaid, Jair bin Abdullah Al Bajali. A piece of land on the shore of the Euphrates River. That's fertile. Let's get some seafood. Bin Habar, Talha bin Ubaidullah, Nashataja, a land in Kufa, Wail bin Hajar al Hadrami, a piece of land near the village of Zura in Kufa, Khalid bin Arfata al Kuda, a piece of land near Hamam, Ayan in Kufa. Al Ashath bin Kays al Kindi, Tizanabad, a place between Kufa and Kadisia. So, if you notice, we recognize some names on this list from reading Hadith. Mashallah. Abu Mirbad al Hanafi, a piece of land at Ahwaz by the river of Tira. Nafi bin al Harith, a piece of land in Shat. Uthman in Basra, Abu Musa al Ashari, a piece of land in Hammam, Umara, oh I see, Umaria, yeah. Uthman bin Abi, no, Uthman bin Abil as Shat Uthman in Basra. So that's a, there's a city, like a, a place, S H A T T, has those two dots underneath the T. It has not been affirmed through an authentic chain that Uthman allotted Fadak to Marwan bin al-Hakam. It is also said that Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan allotted it to him. Okay. That's interesting. Because 
making sure that land is tended is going to help a lot of people get fed. Not letting a famine break out. Well, we have also allotted some land by the coast of Syria so that it could be populated and prepared to confront the Byzantine attacks. Though, through an order of Uthman, he also allotted some land in Antikya and Erzurum. Uthman's policy of allotting land increased the state's income as the farmers paid zakat on their crops when all of the conditions were met. Look at that! So, you got some land. Get that going. Don't let it go to waste. You get the zakat. Zakat and food. Mashallah. His policy of preserving the grazing lands, the horses and camels owned by the state grazed on land that was allocated for that purpose alone. The Prophet, peace be upon him, used to keep the valley of Anaki for horses, and this continued during the caliphates of Abu Bakr and Umar. This land was 80 kilometers long and began 40 kilometers south of Medina. Uthman's methods mirrored those who had preceded him. The Muslim state was expanding through increasing conquests, and consequently the number of citizens had increased as well. In turn, the number of zakat animals spiraled upwards. Land had always been preserved for the grazing of zakat animals. Okay, so that's something I was interested in. So the zakat animals, that's like to have to manage them. I think that'd be a cool job. I would like to have that job. If I lived back then, I'd want to be a cook. Like, obviously, I'd want to have time to study, you know, as well. But I want to work with the animals. But Uthman now allocated more land for this. This was to ensure that all animals were comfortably accommodated and that there was no quarreling among the herdsmen who looked after the animals. Public expenditure. The Caliphs owned money. Uthman was the wealthiest of the Quraysh and their most serious businessman. He took nothing from the state treasury and would spend on his family and those around him from his own pocket. Okay, so... He classifies Uthman as a businessman, and that he has wealth. Wages of governors. During Uthman's time, the Islamic State was divided into provinces. Okay, cool. So we're seeing the terminology here. Islamic State, provinces. Each of which had a governor appointed by the caliph. These governors would be paid from the state treasury, and they ruled their provinces in accordance with the Sharia. The caliph did not delegate representatives to take care of the provincial state treasuries for him. Thus, it was each governor's duty to make sure that all the wealth of his province, the jizya, the tax on agricultural land, and one-tenth of tradable goods was collected. That doesn't seem like a whole lot. Think of all the taxes you have now today. Man, it's pretty sad. He would spend it on the province and then send any excess to the state treasury in Medina. The zakat taken from the wealthy residents of the province was spent on the needy locals. So, provinces, the governor is chosen by the caliph. So, caliph chooses. Caliph chooses governors. So, it's not a republic. They don't run for election. This is a very important one because we have to remember the differences between uh, all the different ocracies, right? And we see here how Islam would make it. So this is important. No democracy. Wages and soldiers. The state treasury paid its military personnel in addition to letting them take the spoils of war. The troops from each province were paid by their oh by their respective treasuries. Uthman bin Affan, for example, wrote the following letter to the governor of Egypt, Abdullah bin Saad. So the governor of Egypt during Uthman's reign, caliphship, was Abdullah bin Saad, instructing him to pay the wages of the troops stationed in Alexandria. 
You know how concerned the commander of the faithful is about Alexandria, since the Byzantines have already broken their treaty twice. Therefore, keep them stationed in Alexandria, pay them their salaries, and rotate them every six months. Oh, see? That's where the six months comes in. Remember when um, Umar bin al-Khattab heard a woman crying, right? And he asked her what was wrong. And then he asked her how long can a woman wait, you know, for her husband. And it was mentioned. And then you see rotating them every six months. <sighs> Men being deployed for like a year, two years. If you think about how Alexander the Great and when he kept expanding and going eastward how far and how long his soldiers were from home and if you have land as a soldier and your family's having a hard time maintaining it while you're gone you know that could be a problem as well six months you know it's like okay it's manageable for a wife your husband's gone for a year and this time, there's no FaceTime, there's no text messages, there's no phone calls. It's a long time to be away. Long time. And it's felt. You know, you can come back and your wife not even love you anymore. So the Byzantines broke their treaty twice. General expenditure on the Hajj. In Uthman's era, the state treasury paid for general matters related to the Hajj such as the cover for the Kaaba, which was made of al kubati an Egyptian linen fabric. Okay, so the Kaaba had a cover even back then, but why does it, why does it need a cover? Is that to prevent like the bird poo? Reconstruction of the Prophet's Mosque. When Uthman became the caliph, people asked him to expand the Prophet's mosque because there was barely enough room for everyone during the Friday prayer. This was because the number of residents in Medina had radically increased after the new conquests. The caliph consulted the companions of Allah's messenger, peace be upon him, and they agreed to tear down the mosque, rebuild it, and make it more spacious than before. After leading the Duhur prayer, Uthman ascended the pulpit, praised Allah, and said, my people, I wish to take down the mosque of Allah's messenger, peace be upon him, and expand it. I bear witness that I have heard the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, say, Allah shall build a house in paradise for him who builds a mosque for Allah. Recorded by Ahmad with an authentic chain of narration. I have been preceded in this by someone, and that someone is Umar bin al-Khattab, for he expanded and further constructed it. I have also consulted the wisest companions of Allah's messenger, peace be upon him, and they have all agreed that I should take it down and then rebuild and expand it. It would be kind of cool they could just build another one next to it. Because it would have been nice if the original that he actually stood in was there. Like if you have a house and someone bulldozes it, rips out the piping, and just that land is barren and then you real build something on top of it, it's, it's a new structure. People welcomed his proposition and invoked a lot for him. The... In the morning, he summoned the workers and participated in the work himself. It would be interesting, though, if they could have built like a strong one then and it lasted for 1,400 years. And then when you stand in it, you're like, this is exactly where he stood. You know. Expansion of Masjid al-Haram. I always wondered, why is it called al-Haram? Because doesn't haram mean like forbidden? So why does it say that? During the days of Allah's Messenger, peace be upon him, there was only a narrow space around the Kaaba where people would pray. The mosque remained like this in the time of Abu Bakr, but when Umar became the Caliph, he expanded it by buying some surrounding buildings, tearing them down, and making them part of the sacred house of Allah. He further improved it by building a short wall around it and keeping the mosque illuminated at night. This was done to accommodate you know, when you the criticize Christians. I hope you know who you Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. While I was reading, my phone started playing a video, a random video from the PBD podcast. Stupid technology, man. Let's continue where we were. We were expanding of 
Masjid Al Haram. Audhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Al Rajim. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Okay, so he expanded the mosque and uh, he bought the wall area and because there was a lot of people who were coming. So the governors of different provinces would also build mosques and spend on them in the on the state treasury. Two examples are the Mosque of Mercy in Alexandria and the mosque that was built in Estakur during the conquests in the east. The first Muslim naval unit. The state treasury in Uthman's era contributed to the establishment of the first naval unit in the history of Islam. We shall discuss the role of this navy in the Islamic conquests in the relevant chapter. Then why even put it there? My guy, if you're not going to talk about it. See, that's bad organizing. You don't need to mention it if you're not going to talk about it right then and there. Transferring the harbor from Ashuaiba to Jeddah. In 26 AH, the people of Mecca requested that Uthman transfer the harbor from Ashuaiba, the old harbor of Mecca in the pre-Islamic period, to its current location in Jeddah since it was close to Mecca. Uthman went to Jeddah after seeing the place. He ordered that the harbor be moved there. Then he went and bathed in the sea, saying, It is blessed. He told those who were with him, Go into the sea and bathe, but only do so while wearing a waist wrapper. Afterwards, he left for Medina by the road of Asfan, and from that day onwards, people stopped using the shore of Ashuay Bay. Ashuaiba. Jeddah has been established seaport of Mecca ever since. Oh. See, this is a cool one because it lets you know the uh, geography. It's a difficult name to say. Ash, Ash, Ashuaiba. Jeddah. Okay, so a harbor. Digging wells. During Uthman's time, the Strait Treasury financed the digging of a drinking well called Ariz, which was located two miles from Medina. This happened in 30 A.H. One day, when Uthman was sitting by the well with the ring of Allah's Messenger, peace be upon him, on his finger, the ring somehow slipped and fell into the well. People tried to find it and even emptied the well, but to no avail. Uthman was greatly distressed and promised a large amount of money to anyone who found the ring for him. But the ring was never found. Having lost all hope of finding it, he made a new ring, just like the original, from silver and had carved on it Muhammad the Messenger of Allah. He put it on his finger where it remained until he was killed. No one knows what happened to that ring. <laughs> wait, 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 he said. Okay, so this is a well called Ariz in 30 AH. That would suck to have it, you know, something that, that precious. But imagine they go and they dig it, they find it. That's cool. But I bet you some archaeologists probably have gone there, right? And tried to find it. I don't know how all wells are constructed, but... Back then, was I don't know if they had a concrete bottom, a well. I don't know. But if it has doesn't have a concrete bottom and it's something heavy, it's going to sink down and go into the mud, right? I don't know how a well works. I've never taken water out of a well. So, I'm not sure how it works. Wages of the Muadhins. Uthman was the first caliph to ever pay the Muadhins from the state treasury. Imam Ashafi states, the leader of guidance, Uthman bin Affan, provided for the Muadhins. He specified an allowance for announcing the Adhan call to prayer, but he did not actually hire the Muadhins themselves. Okay, because if you remember, we saw, we read hadiths about uh, not uh, hiring Muadhins being paid. But uh, this is uh, to pick one who doesn't expect to be paid, right? But you can see here that he just gave them allowance. They didn't say, like, you, you have to give me this. Or I won't do it, right? So, I'm going to put a little star next to this one. So, an allowance. 
so willingly giving, right? So you give something for the sake of Allah, there's barakah in it. So he didn't have to do that, but he chose to do it. MashaAllah. Financing to meet the highest goals of Islam. After studying the aforementioned avenues of public expenditure, one can see that the state treasury financed the highest goals of the Muslim state. In addition to spending regularly on its administration and the well-being of its citizens, beyond that it used its funds to spread the religion of Islam and make the word of Allah prevail. Okay, so using the state treasury money. Okay, so state treasury to finance goals of Islam. So when you think about how you have the goals of Islam and how they are to be sought after, right? The first Islamic naval force was established and the mosques were supported by spending upon construction, renovation, and allocation of allowances for the Muadhines. Okay, so... Got a naval force. So the navy... I'm surprised that they didn't have a navy already because they have some water, right? Because he just told us there was a harbor in a seaport by Mecca. I haven't studied the geography, but I kind of thought they would already have that. Construction, renovation. So, let's do a refresher here. So, money... Switching harbors, money for the Muadhin, expanding Masjid al Haram, and the Uthman's era, he would help out with getting the cover for the Kaaba. He had a Muslim governor in Egypt who was dealing with the Byzantines. Abdullah bin Saad was the governor of Egypt during that time. And the Islamic State was divided into provinces, okay? And they are appointed by the Caliph. There isn't like an election and there's not campaigns and our democracy is at stake. It's not that, okay? He was known as a businessman. He had wealth. And there's land for grazing that has to be preserved for the zakat animals. And he allocated some of the abandoned land to the people on the long list we read, and they paid zakat on their crops. Okay. He was good at managing those lands. Okay. Perfect. All right. And we did recognize some of the names of those people from Hadith, which is great. And sadly, he lost his ring, but he made another one like it. Okay. Take care, fam. And let me know what's something that you really like about this book, because we've gotten to really dig into his character. Only critique I have for it is that the, he, the numbers of the citations, they should be on the page themselves, not all the way in the back of the book, so that we can easily reference them. And remember... The Muadahin is the ones who do the ad hand, the call to prayer. Okay? Take care, and please like, comment, and subscribe. And if you'd like to read more about what I write, you can do so by going to my blog, which is www.subscribestar.com. Hope to see you there.